Hello and person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a resolution to a somewhat interesting mystery of what brown dwarfs may actually look like. Brown dwarfs, of course, being these unusual objects that never really got to become a star, but they are way too massive to be a planet. And more specifically, we're talking about the nearest and the most famous brown dwarfs to us, the objects known as Loman A and Loman B. The objects that are also known as WISE 1049-5319 that were discovered back in 2013 and technically represent the third closest object to our solar system. And since these are relatively recently discovered objects, it obviously makes us very curious about what they might actually look like. Mostly because they are very dark, almost impossible to see with optical telescopes and also hide so many different mysteries about their origin as well. But let's talk a little bit more about this, starting with the idea of what we've always believed they might look like. So today we know that typical brown dwarfs range in temperature from anywhere colder than planet Earth, so basically temperatures of about minus 100 degrees Celsius, up to temperatures of several thousand degrees. And we've already found several brown dwarfs that have temperatures close to about 3000 degrees Kelvin meaning that some of them are on the verge of becoming stars, but they'll probably never become stars simply because they don't have enough mass. At the same time, a typical brown dwarf is somewhere around the temperature of about 1000 degrees Kelvin, with some of them even having temperatures close to planet Earth. Which also, of course, means that they might possess uh, liquid water and, of course, water clouds as well, which then brings the question of possible life. But that's not a question we can answer right now. But because generally we expect them to kind of resemble Jupiter, at least to some extent, it's always been kind of interesting for us to figure out if all of them kind of have this Jupiter feature or if some of them have different features altogether. For example, do they start resembling stars or do they maybe start having a lot of global storms on the surface dominating most of their features? So basically we just wanted to know what they actually look like on the surface. And if they have these global storms, do they basically resemble just a bunch of great red spots like this spot on Jupiter just across the entire surface? Which is sort of kind of what you see right here where there's a lot of different storms all over the surface. At the same time, maybe they look like something entirely different. Maybe they resemble something between the planet and the star. And because of this, for the past few years, scientists have been thoroughly trying to investigate the nearest brown dwarfs, Loman A and Loman B, and trying to see what we can detect on their surface and possibly find some of the features coming from various emissions that these brown dwarfs produce. Now, these two brown dwarfs are only about six and a half light years away from us, so like I said, one of the nearest objects to us, and at the same time, they're not really old, they're not really young, they're about 800 million years old. They also orbit around one another, the single orbit here takes around 27 years. And the distance between them is roughly around three and a half astronomical units, or about 500 million kilometers. And that's kind of similar to half of the distance of Jupiter to the Sun. In terms of the total mass, the larger or the more massive object is about 33 masses of Jupiter, the smaller one is about 28 masses of Jupiter. And in the last few years we discovered that because of this mass difference, they do have slightly different features on the surface and also slightly different effects. But you can also learn more about this in one of the previous videos that might actually pop up somewhere above my head. But in terms of size though, they're not very different from Jupiter, meaning that they just have much higher density. For example, if I were to try to simulate them in Universe Sandbox, this is how Jupiter, Loman A and Loman B would look like. With the density of the larger object being about 9 times the density of planet Earth, and the one here being about 7 to 8 times more dense. But as you can see in terms of size, and I guess even in terms of appearance, they're not really that different. Although the question here is of course, do they really look like this, and of course, do they have these stripes, and do they have any other features that Jupiter might not have? But because of the sheer distances involved, and also because these objects don't really produce much optical light, we didn't really know they even existed until 2014. They were actually discovered during the second stage of the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer that NASA was using back in 2013-2014 to try to discover various asteroids, specifically asteroids that might collide with planet Earth. And they were using infrared observations for this, which allowed them to see various infrared objects out there, basically objects that were only emitting infrared light. 
And although it was really successful at detecting a lot of different asteroids and a lot of different comets, the detections here went way beyond the solar system and some of the discoveries were from thousands of light years away. It also took some incredible infrared pictures of some of the more famous objects, like this one right here. This is the Andromeda galaxy in the infrared light. But because it was able to discover some of these brown dwarfs, this is where things got more interesting because we realized that there are a lot of these brown dwarfs hiding all over the galaxy. We just can't really see them because they only emit infrared light. And since the original discovery, we learned quite a lot of things about them, and we also understand them better mathematically and theoretically, we just still can't really see them very well. Like for example, we know that because of their mass, they're able to fuse certain materials and create energy that way. Some of them are able to fuse deuterium and produce energy using deuterium, and some of them are able to fuse lithium as well. And because of this, some of these brown dwarfs can reach these ridiculously high temperatures. Temperatures that are really not that far off from a smaller star such as a red dwarf. But I guess the question is, do these high temperatures turn them into something a little bit different from a typical gas giant such as Jupiter, such as Saturn? To answer these questions, the scientists whose paper you can find in the description below decided to take a look at these brown dwarfs by using the TESS telescope and essentially just use the data from the TESS where it was staring at the same spot for several days to try to understand what's happening on the surface of these beautiful giants. They were able to collect a lot of data points and were then able to analyze these data points, creating a kind of a frequency graph to try to understand what's happening on the surface of these giants. And following this, they were able to create this as a model. So basically, we think that these objects look like Jupiter, but with much hotter surface. Here, the stripes represent these very hot interiors, with the darker patches representing a kind of a cloud deck that basically blocks the heat from the inside. They also seem to have really high speed on the equator, with slightly lower speeds as you go up or down away from the equator. And also, most interestingly, they seem to have these very specific storms, similar to the um, red giant spot on Jupiter, but in this case in the polar regions of these objects. And in some sense, this of course resembles what's happening on Jupiter, but it's more likely that they don't actually have as many individual storms on the surface. And it's also very likely that they seem to have these very large polar storms, kind of like what we find on Saturn with its very famous hexagon storm. But unlike Saturn, or even unlike Jupiter, where the actual stripes are not as well defined, or even unlike these objects that I created in Universe Sandbox, it seems that the Lomon objects are a lot more stripy in a sense. They have these very strongly pronounced stripes, which are formed by the darker clouds, and the much brighter stripes formed by the very hot gas that comes from within the uh, gas giant or brown dwarf itself, and sort of circulate on the surface. Now, none of this is of course new to us, as a matter of fact, this does kind of meet all of the models that previously were created by various scientists, but it does answer the question of these central storms. Unlike Jupiter and unlike, I guess, Saturn, they don't seem to have as many storms forming in the regions where there are very strong winds, but they do have a lot of storms in the polar regions. And because in the past we've also discovered that the wind speeds here are really high, much, much higher than on Jupiter, probably close to about 700 meters per second at the equator, and also because these objects have ridiculously strong magnetospheres, some of them able to produce very, very powerful flares, some of which we've recently detected as well, all of this means that unlike Jupiter and unlike Saturn, these objects are ridiculously powerful. As a matter of fact, referring to them as failed stars is a little bit unfair because some of them are even more powerful than some of the stars we've discovered, at least in terms of the production of flares and in terms of the production of magnetic fields. But also, unlike the previous observations that suggested that these objects have relatively large spots on the surface, these new observations tend to suggest that these spots are probably temporary, meaning that for the most part these objects seem to have these stripes which are permanent, with occasional darker spot that seems to form when maybe there is some kind of interruption or some sort of a disruption based on something happening on the surface. And so in essence, this is what we believe a typical brown dwarf looks like. And considering that six years ago, this is the only picture that we had of these brown dwarfs, we've kind of gone pretty far in being able to now analyze their surface and recreate the surface by using all of the modern understanding on how these storms function on the surface of these unusual objects. And honestly, brown dwarfs are definitely really fascinating, especially the ones that tend to have temperatures close to planet Earth. 
Whatever is happening on the surface of those brown dwarfs is definitely really interesting for people studying astrobiology. Can life truly exist in these objects? Can life possibly form in the upper atmosphere where the temperatures are not that different from the temperature on the planet Earth? And since a typical brown dwarf can hypothetically contain hundreds of times more water and more organic molecules in its atmosphere, it obviously gives life a lot more opportunities to be created on those objects as well. And so trying to discover what happens in the atmospheres of these unusual objects and trying to learn more about the chemical composition and of course the structure of the atmosphere of these objects can help us one day maybe discover life somewhere where we didn't really expect to find any. At the same time, the analysis performed in this particular study will definitely help us in the future when it comes to analyzing the atmospheres of other planets, because this particular method is extremely effective at trying to identify what happens on surfaces of other objects as well. And so this is actually a really interesting and a very important study in trying to learn more about exoplanets of all different types and of all different shapes. But I guess until we learn more about brown dwarfs, or until we discover something else really interesting about them, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video. Since the original discovery six years ago, I've been really fascinated with these unusual objects, and studying them and trying to understand what's going on on them, I think is really important for our understanding of the evolution of various planets and evolution of star systems in general. But it's also possibly a good way for us to find unusual life somewhere out there. So until we learn more, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.